Welcome back everyone. We have a fun video to get into today. We're gonna to be looking not at my portfolio. Typically I show you my portfolio and we look at the performance and I talk about my holdings and what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about different things. And I'm gonna to continue to do this. So this isn't going anywhere. I'll keep doing that, but I'm starting a new series and I'm gonna be starting it with this video. So this is the kickoff. I wanna see if you like it. What I plan on doing is doing portfolio reviews of different important super investors. People that are spectacular investors that are well known, some of them are infamous, people like Michael Burry. And that's the one that we're gonna be talking about today. Michael Burry is an incredible investor. In my opinion, and I say this, I don't think as an overstatement, I think he's genuinely one of the best investors alive today. And the fortunate thing for us is, when you manage over $100 million, like Michael Burry does, you are legally obligated to give certain disclosures once a quarter. The disclosure is called the 13F filing. That is a filing that every single asset manager that manages over $100 million has to file once a quarter of the holdings that they had at the time. Now, those holdings could change, so they might not be perfectly up to date, but it gives us a little look on the actual portfolio construction of the person that we're looking at. In this case, Michael Burry. So I'm gonna be going over Michael Burry's portfolio. I'll be reacting to the changes. I'll be reacting to him having a bearish view on Apple and having a put on Apple. And we'll be looking at that together. Now, before we jump into Michael Burry's portfolio, I think it's really important to give some background to who Michael Burry is. Because frankly, the internet persona of him, what the internet thinks he is and what he actually is are two very different things. Most people know about Michael Burry as the big short guy, the guy that had that one lucky bet back in 2007. And outside of that, he's just kind of a weird doomsdayer on Twitter, right? That's kind of the perception. That's not an accurate depiction of Michael Burry. Now, let's go ahead and just rewind all the way back to when he was two years old. When Michael Burry was two years old, he was diagnosed with retinoblastoma in his left eye. Retinoblastoma is a cancer that spawns from the retina of your eye. Now, to treat this, to remove the cancer, the doctors decided the only option was to get rid of the eye. So they took out his left eye and they replaced it with a glass eye. This was at the age of two. I can't imagine what he had to go through, but through his own words, he describes this as causing him to be antisocial. He could not communicate well with other kids. They mocked him. They thought he was weird. His eye would look different directions. It didn't close the same, right? He just looked kind of odd. And he was treated as an oddball growing up in school. This led him to be reclusive, to recede into his own mind, uh, to have his thoughts just bounce around in his own brain. So he didn't discuss things that often with other people. He discussed them with himself in his mind. Now, obviously, Michael Burry is incredibly intelligent. Uh, he grew up to become a doctor. He is actually Dr. Burry, not just Michael Burry. And during medical school and becoming a medical doctor, he also had a huge interest in investing. So much so that he wrote an investing blog that he updated frequently. It had his insights on the market. It had his bullish positions and his bearish positions. And it had his performance with his personal portfolio. Michael Burry's insights and performance were so phenomenally good on his personal portfolio that it caught the attention with people that had a lot more money than him. People that had big money caught notice that this guy knows how to invest. He has incredibly good performance. He makes money in up markets and down markets and his insights most of the time are dead accurate. So they contacted Michael Burry. They said, look, you're managing this small amount of money. We want you to manage more, manage my money. And that's how his fund was started. Michael Burry started to manage more money. During the time that he was trying to balance being a medical doctor and doing investing, he himself says that he was so tired at some points from staying up the entire night, from trying to balance both disciplines, that he literally felt like he was going to fall asleep while standing. That's the way that he describes it. Now, obviously, I don't think he's practicing medicine anymore. He obviously discontinued that to do investing. There's simply a lot more money in his skill set in investing. And as such, he got a lot more money to manage. And this is where a lot of the misconceptions come into play. One of the big things that you hear about Michael Burry is this guy got lucky. He just had the one big call in 2007. And outside of that, he's just kind of a perma bear. Other people are frankly upset with Michael Burry because he is outspoken on his bearishness with Tesla. Tesla is a very popular retail stock. So there's a lot of contention there between those two groups. Now, let me go ahead and look at the actual data here. Let's just review this for a minute. I'll put on the screen the performance of Michael Burry's Skyen Asset Management Fund 
from its inception. In the year 2000, the S&P 500 went down 7.45%. His fund went up 8.2%. In the year 2001, the S&P 500 went down 11.88%. His fund went up 55%. 2002, the S&P 500 went down 22%. Burry's portfolio went up 16%. In 2003, the S&P 500 rebounded. It went up 28.6%. His went up 50%. He doubled even on the bull market. Even when the market was going up, he still doubled the returns. So from 2000 to 2003, he absolutely crushed the S&P 500. If you even go further, in 2004, he basically matched the performance of SPY. In 2005, he beat it by three percentage points. In 2006, still before the big short ever was a thing, he had lower returns. And the reason why is he was making that big bet on the housing crash during 2006 and it hadn't played off yet. But even while he was losing money in 2006 in anticipation of this big bet, the aggregate performance from 2000 to 2006 is that Burry's portfolio was up 208% while the S&P 500 is up 3.2%. So when people say that Burry got lucky in 2007 with his big bearish call, and outside of that, he's not a great investor, go ahead and show them this. Go and show them the performance from 2000 to 2006. His performance was 208%. The S&P 500 was 3.2. And the QQQ at the time was even worse. Michael Burry absolutely crushed the S&P 500 before the big short was ever a thing. And then during that big short time period, when his bets finally played out, as he accurately predicted with the collapse of the mortgages, his fund was launched into the stratosphere. His fund went from having 208% aggregate returns to 696%. 696 versus the S&P 500 that was down 50% that year. So I think the big takeaway from this is that even outside of the big short event that made him very popular in media, even putting that aside, he's still amongst the best performance in the market. He's still one of the best hedge fund managers in the top quintile. He has 208% returns from 2000 to 2006. Not many people did that. He has very good run-ups during bullish markets, very good plays during bearish markets. He plays the market either way, long or short. And this is something that I think a lot of people miss. They consider him to be lucky in a one-time event, unlikely to be repeated, and that just isn't what his experience shows. So having given some context to some of his background, let's go ahead and look at his portfolio. This is the latest of his portfolio right now as of March 31st. So this could have changed, you know, he can make changes right now today that we wouldn't know about. But as of March 31st, this is what his portfolio looked like. One of the biggest things to highlight here, and it's not reported in Datarama, is Michael's Skyon Asset Management, which is his fund, uh, held a bearish put option against 206,000 Apple shares as of March 31st. So he was bearish on Apple last quarter. My guess is he thought Apple ran up a little bit. It was kind of the, the last of all the tech companies to crack, right? Apple's sitting there, you know, still kind of keeping its gains over the past year and everything else is falling off a cliff. And Michael Burry's probably thinking, Apple's got to come down, right? This market is super bearish. Even Apple's going to eventually fall because it got up to a higher PE ratio. And my guess is he's probably in the green on this bearish position. Now, in my opinion, do I think that Michael Burry is overall bearish on the next five years of Apple or the next 10 years? I don't know, but my guess is probably not. In my opinion, this is a short-term oriented play. He does many of these. If he sees a company become overvalued to a, a large extent, and he sees a lot of macroeconomic factors working against it, he, he buys puts against it, which means he benefits. He profits if the price goes down. And he does that all the time. So he's constantly betting for companies and betting against them. Michael Burry has summarized that he looks at investing as just finding value and he'll do it in both directions. Now, moving on to the rest of his portfolio, he continues to hold BMY, Bristol Myers Squibb, as his top holding, which is unchanged. If we bring this one up, we can take a look at BMY here. This is with Qualtrum Insights. It's available to Patreon members. Bristol Myers Squibb is a pharmaceutical company. It's a value company, one that I think would hold up very well in this market. It has a Ford PE ratio of 9.82. So it's a pharma company, value company, super low PE, uh, you know, just a place to put cash that I think Michael Burry believes will outperform the market. In fact, looking at the past year, BMY is up 17%. Year to date, it's up 24%. So his top holding has done very well. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at 
Booking Holdings. This one I thought was a little bit more surprising. He just recently bought into Booking Holdings. So let's go ahead and bring this one up. It has an $85 billion market cap. The Ford PE ratio is a little bit higher in this market. It has a 24 Ford PE. But it looks like to me that the revenue declined because of the pandemic and it's starting to recover. So maybe this PE ratio isn't telling the full story and over the next year or two, uh, this company is gonna do well. And looking at the stock price, this one is on a bit of a slump. So I don't know what the play here is. This one kind of surprises me because I thought Michael Burry would be going more for those deep value companies, but here he is buying booking holdings. Maybe he assumes so many people are going on vacation, they'll put up really good numbers throughout the rest of this year. And I think a lot of people are concerned, including Michael Burry, about going into a recession, which I don't know if this is the one that you want to hold during a recession. Now, another one that he added to as an 11% stake in his portfolio is Warner Bros. Discovery. So this is one that I think he's been in and out of for some time. I think he likes this company. Warner Bros. Discovery is a media company that's moving to streaming. They're going to be competing with Netflix, and it's a value company. It has a very low PE at 7.9 Ford, so... You know, it's just trading at a low multiple. I think it's been discounted because of all the Netflix news and, you know, all these streaming companies like Netflix, Disney, Warner Media have all traded down. And I think that Michael Burry just sees this place as a place to put money that's likely to outperform because it's already discounted to a huge extent. Now, the next company that's a new one in his portfolio is a little bit surprising to me because Michael Burry often talks negatively about tech companies but he introduced Google as a top holding in his portfolio with a 10.93% uh, position size. So this is a significant position in his portfolio. And if we look at Google here, obviously I'm very bullish on this company uh, in the short term and in the long term. Google trades with a 24 PE ratio, which is low considering the quality of the company, the insulation of their earnings, uh, the core business and how it's growing just how everything's evolving for Google over the next five years, I think that a 24 PE ratio is undervalued. Now, again, we don't know whether these are long-term holds based off of fundamental valuations or they're kind of just short-term swing trades. So Michael Burry might just be buying these as a short-term position. We don't know. But either way, I think that Google is a undervalued company. It has a low PE ratio compared to the quality of the company. And I think it's likely to outperform to a large extent over the next five years. So under those circumstances, whether it's short term or long term, I think that it makes sense in Michael Burry's portfolio. Now, just after Google, we have Cigna Corp with a 10.8% weighting. And this is, again, a new, a new holding in his portfolio. Cigna is also a value company trading at a low PE ratio, steady revenue growth and EBITDA growth and earnings. They have a lot of free cash flow. They do share buybacks. This is just a very basic value investment to put money in. Seems like a very good one for Michael Burry because he thinks that inflation will continue to run hot. He thinks that we probably will go into a recession. Um, he also thinks that the Fed interest rates are going to continue to go up. If you have those type of thoughts, a place to have your money is likely a low PE value company that has high amounts of free cash flow and can do things to offset the cost. So Cigna Corporation is definitely one of those companies. Now, after Cigna Corporation, we have another semi-surprising buy from Michael Burry, because again, he's often outspoken against tech companies, but he did capitulate and buy Facebook. He bought Meta with a 10.75% holding size. So this is again, a very large holding. Now, most of you know my thoughts on Facebook because I recently just bought this company as well, but I think it's just cheap. It's too cheap. Now. A lot of people say, Joseph, weren't you bearish on Facebook like the beginning of the year? Didn't you have a lot of concerns that led you to sell out of it? That's true. I sold out of Facebook at 350 per share because I was very concerned about the things that Mark Zuckerberg was saying with the, the metaverse and how it was trending and you know, it, you know all these different plans that he had that I think were against the core business. That led me to sell out of the company. But Facebook traded down 40% over 40%. So now it trades at a huge discount. And even me, not really being super bullish in all these metaverse plans, I just think the core company is way too cheap and it discounts even more than anything going on right now. So at this large of a discount, I put money back into Facebook, but now we have Michael Burry buying the company as well. My prediction is over the next couple of months, when we get all these 13F filings, I think that Facebook is going to be the most purchased company amongst super investors. I think it'll attract the most money because 
It's trading at a huge discount. It has a big monopoly. Mark Zuckerberg even said that he's going to kind of slow down spending on the metaverse, which is exactly what people wanted to hear that are invested in Facebook. So I think a lot of things could move to the positive for this company. But Michael Burry, I think, clearly sees that this company is probably oversold. It's a place to put money in right now. It's cheap, has high amounts of free cash flow, doing share buybacks, and it will probably weather the storm of rising inflation and interest rates better than most companies. Now, the next one's a company I've never heard of before. It's a 9.81% holding called Aventiv, ticker symbol OVV. I had to actually read what this company does. It is a hydrocarbon exploration and production company organized in Delaware. So it seems like an energy play. This one is up 28% year to date. So this seems like a simple energy play, commodity play in his portfolio. I'm guessing he's going to ride this up and sell out of it when he thinks that the valuations have gotten ahead of themselves. Now, after OVV, we have ticker symbol NXST, which is Nexstar Media Group, another company that I'm not that familiar with, but it looks like a company that owns a lot of broadcast station networks, and they they basically charge for this big network that they have. So again, we see Michael Burry diving into the media companies. He has the Warner Media Holding. He has Nexstar Media Group. This one sells at an 8.5 Ford PE ratio. It's a small company, I guess, in regards to these other ones. It's at a $7 billion market cap. It has growing revenue, growing EBITDA. It's free cash flow positive. Um, it even pays a healthy dividend, and they're doing share buybacks. So overall, this one would be an interesting one to do a more deep dive into. But that's another one that's a new holding in his portfolio. He just purchased it. It's at an 8.68% holding. Now, next up behind Nextar Media Group, we have Stellantis. STLA with a 5.9% weighting. This company is a merger of Fiat Chrysler. And this is something that's not surprising because Michael Burry also has an interest in other automotive companies besides Tesla. Basically, that's the one that he's bearish on. He thinks a lot of these other ones are very undervalued. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if he went into like Volkswagen, uh, if he went into Fiat Chrysler or any of these. Uh, he's often talked about them on Twitter. Now, year to date, this company is down 27%. So it's not doing too well, but maybe he feels like he's buying the dip here on an undervalued company. And if he's just buying into it over the past month or so, you know, he could be basically flat. It's down 5% in the past month. So that is the next biggest holding. After that, we have Global Payments with a 5.5% weighting, ticker symbol GPN. Global Payments, like the name implies, is a company that offers payment solutions and services. And this company, again, looks very much like a, a value investment right now. It has a PE ratio of 12.3, below the S&P 500. It has growing revenues, high amounts of free cash flow, and it's doing share buybacks. Those are all the typical things you'd look for in a typical value investment. If we look at the performance over the last five years, it traded up until 2021. Now it's down 44.8% from its all-time high. So Michael Burry is probably buying this one thinking that it's oversold, has some downside protection, and maybe he's buying the dip in it. So that is GPN with a 5.5% weighting. The last one in his portfolio is SPWH, Sportsman Warehouse, with a 1.62% weighting. Now the Sportsman Warehouse one is an interesting one. I don't know what he really sees in it or what the play here is. It has a low PE ratio, it's a retailer. If we look at the stock chart here, it looks a little abnormal, right? It goes up really high, then it levels out unusually flat, which means something was going on during this time. And usually if a stock trades at like one price, that means it's doing a merger, it's being acquired by a different company. And we can see that Sportsman Warehouse is ending its merger with great outdoors over FTC clearance concerns. That was December 2nd. So that's probably why you see the huge decline here and the company continuing to sell off. But regardless, I consider a 1.62% holding to be somewhat insignificant. I would look at the other top holdings that he has. So overall, the common themes that I see here looking at these companies is he likes media, he likes pharmaceutical, and he's even dipped his toes into tech companies with Google and Facebook. Two companies that I agree with him are largely undervalued. Uh, booking is the only one that really confuses me, this Booking Holdings. I don't know why he's doing this one. I'd be interested to hear his reasoning. But the common theme here is these companies all typically have low PE ratios. The only one that really has above a market average PE ratio is Booking Holdings and Google, which is a significantly better company than most of them in the S&P 500. And he's even bearish, or he was bearish against Apple. So 
he is very much focused on these low PE value oriented companies. Lots of them are, are big market cap companies like Facebook and Google, then a lot of ones that are even smaller ones that I've never heard of. And he's also in the automotive industry, but he's not making any bets on Tesla. In my opinion, I think that he's still widely bearish on Tesla. So that's his portfolio as of now. And you may be critical on his views and his politics and the things that he posts on Twitter. But again, performance speaks for itself. Michael Burry's performance, even recently, over the past three years or over the past five years, is just outstanding. 199% performance over the past five years. Compare that against the S&P 500, which is at 70%. He continues to be an incredible investor that posts these amazing returns. But there is one warning I would give. Out of all the investors that you could try to follow and try to imitate their strategy, I think that trying to look at Michael Burry's portfolio and simply mirroring it or copying it is not going to work out well. He makes very rapid changes. He's not afraid to aggressively go in on plays and out of plays, be short companies and long different companies. And he's doing these all at a very frequent pace. So trying to simply just imitate exactly what he's doing by looking at 13F filings is going to leave you trailing behind and you're likely not going to have anywhere close to the same performance. So in my opinion, out of the different investors you can try to imitate, you could try to imitate Manish Pabrai or... Bill Ackman or Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, but Michael Burry is one that while interesting, I would just give fair warning against trying to copy him. That's all for this little episode. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know if you want me to do more of these in the future and I'll cover more big time investors.